Hey, I'm Jeff Cohen. Everything you hear on WNPR, from local news and talk shows to the national programs you love, is made possible because of listener support. You make it happen. You give the radio its signal, the computer its stream, the smartphone its podcast. You make it so we can reach you wherever you are. We love that you listen, but we also need your dollars. Go to WNPR.org and click on Donate in the upper right-hand corner. Thanks for helping out. Wait a minute. This is a trap. Battle stations. I never should have trusted the Cardassians. Scotty, transfer all the power in the forward thruster to the rear thrusters. Then transfer the rear thrusters to the forward thrusters. Just do it. Check off. Launch photon torpedoes. Uhuru, open a comm line to Ensign Yu in the shuttle. Ensign Yu? Yes, Captain. I want you to create a diversion. Draw off some of their fire. When you say draw off some of their fire... You heard me. Does that mean intentionally get the massive Cardassian ship to shoot at me? Of course that's what it means. I'm sorry, Captain. I didn't hear you. There's a lot of subspace interference. You did too, hear me? Go shoot at them and make them shoot back at you. You're still a little fuzzy, but I'm pretty sure I heard you say... Go hide behind the orange planet and be as safe as possible. I, Captain. Over and out. Wait until his annual performance review comes up. Uh, excuse me, did somebody say performance review? Who are you? Remember, I'm Lori Ellen Shakley from Starfleet Human Resources. We have an appointment scheduled for right now. I'm kind of busy. Me too. It's like I start the day with a to-do list and I cross half of them off and then the day is over. Can't this wait? Oh, I wish it could, but you are way overdue on giving me your annual goals. Remember we just switched over to the Smarty model? S is for specific, M is for make it so, A is for achievable, R is for resistance is futile, T is for time-based, and Y is for you will be assimilated. Yes, but we're under attack by a Cardassian warbird. I love that show, but Chloe was such a bitch to Courtney at the birthday party last week. No, you're doing, everybody does this. The Cardassians are a devious, ruthless people from a hot, humid world who value personal strength and self-interest above all else. But the Cardassians, well, just take my word for it, they're two different things. So can we talk about cycle-specific goals? Here's one I sketched out for you. By Stardate 11111112, develop and implement a customer service plan that results in department staff reporting that they're clear about expectations for excellent customer service. (laughs) Customer service? What are you talking about? I'm in the middle of a battle here. I know. So many buttons, too. I I don't know how you keep track of them all. What does this one do? Don't touch that. You just, you just killed Ensign Yu. Oh. Guess I don't have to bug him about turning in his evidence-based community vision goals. Let's listen to a nice radio show instead. And now I always tell him not to forget that the word try is in tricorder. Colin McEnroe. Well, she has a point there. Uh, all right, we're talking about Star Trek today. I can't believe we're the only public radio show that's it's 50 years today. I can't believe I'm, I'm so happy we're the only public radio show. This is when it all began. And when I say it all began, there's so many different things that Star Trek is, so many ways in, in which Star Trek has been interpreted over time. But it has proven an indelible franchise. I, I can't tell you what a shock to the system it was in 1966. I was more or less like a seventh grader or something when I first saw saw Star Trek. I had never seen anything like it in my life. And it looked goofy a a little bit, yes. And certainly by today's production standards, it looked goofy. And when they would fight on planets, he's kind of styrofoam (laughs) rocks and stuff. But it was, I mean, I don't know. That that was not important somehow. It really was, at the level of production, a very exciting thing. It may have something to do with the advent of color television. We'll talk about uh, all those things. But mainly what we want to talk about today, both for those of you who have loved this franchise in one of its forms or all of its forms, and for those of you who are wondering, why would we devote an entire show to talking about something like Star Trek? People who don't get it, never was there. We're going to try to sort of do a show that both of you can enjoy. In studio with me is Sam Hatch, who's one of the two uh, hosts of the Culture Dogs on Sunday nights at WWH. 
uh, WWUH. I'm not beginning very well. Is it 8 p.m.? Is that when it starts? 8 p.m. You're correct, yes. I mean, I never miss it, but, you know. So on WWUH, that's the Culture Dogs. And then joining us uh, through our connection to WBEZ in Chicago is Caroline Sida, a freelance writer who writes for the AV Club, Boing Boing, Vox, and other places. She's joining us, as I said, from the studios of WBEZ. Caroline, I'm going to have you get us started. And, and maybe one of the things we kind of need to do is to say, even though this has had a lot of iterations, it's been a lot of different TV series and a lot of different movies, and the movies have been made by people with very different visions of what it was that they were doing. Are there some through lines that we can kind of locate and say, this is a series about X, Y, and Z. This is how it's different from Star Wars. This is what makes Star Trek Star Trek. What do you, what do you think the DNA of this franchise really is? I think that the the key to Star Trek's success and longevity is that it's sort of, it's optimistic about the future, but it's honest about the present. So you have a show that imagines a world in which racial divides are gone and gender divides are gone and humanity is just sort of working together to make everything a good place. But you also have the show sort of tackling these really tricky, really relevant real world issues through allegory. So it's easy to think that the show is maybe sort of Pollyannish in its vision of the future, but I think it's that sort of allegorical edge that has really made the show last so long. See, and one way that I think that those two star things are different <laughs> is that Star Wars exists within mainly a kind of mythic framework. You know, this is basically people living with inside a mythology, mm-hmm. whereas Star Trek is about people living inside a series of systems. There's Starfleet Command. There's a ship that has all kinds of rules and regulations. This is about people trying to make uh, – we don't live in mythic systems for the most part. We live in systems more like Star Trek. And it's a promise of a future, too, whereas Star Wars is a long time ago. And again, all that stuff, forget about it. It already happened happened, whereas Star Trek is this promise of a future. And the same thing. It's it's a hopeful future. It's, it's There's a potential for a utopia, and it wears its heart on its sleeve a little bit. That's admirable. But it does have a little bit of an edge to it because, yes, they're running into other cultures that are backwards cultures. They're not quite uh, warp generated, warp speed uh, generated uh, ready yet. So we can apply our life and, and our fears and our problems onto other you know, populaces and other planets out there, other systems, and find a way to overcome that through the embrace of Captain James T. Kirk. Caroline, one of the initial signs of this, so Gene Roddenberry is the guy who created all this, and as it's initially launched, I mean, there's sort of a real naked telegraphed sign of what his message is. This is still really, it's 1966, it's the middle of the Cold War, you know, the worst of Vietnam is really still to come. There's all kinds of really bad things that are going to happen, a lot of strife in the world, and a lot of not getting along. Not that we've eliminated that problem or anything, but a specific kind of not getting along. And one of the first things you see on this star- starship is that one One of the primary officers is a guy named Chekhov. He is a member. He is clearly from what was then called itself the Soviet Union. Those were our mortal enemies. So there's this initial notion that they're going to repeat again and again that it's possible to overcome these really primal hatreds. Yeah, absolutely. And I think I'm glad you brought up Chekhov because I think the show gets so much credit rightly for having um, a lot of racial diversity. But I do think Chekhov is really fascinating and in his own way, optimistic character because he does represent, you know, like you said, we're in the middle of this intense conflict and look in the future, it won't be that way. And what's remarkable to me about that original series is that when you look at especially the racial breakdown of the cast. You know, you have Michelle Nichols, a black woman. In space, you have George Takei, a Japanese-American man. And that is a racial diversity that we would still see in a movie today and consider diverse. And this was in, in 1966. So if you want an example of just how progressive Star Trek is, I think you can't get a better one than that. So much of this is kind of hard to understand or hard to imagine now for people, I think, to understand how revolutionary it would have been to have a character like Chekhov in in the middle of the Cold War. But another thing that was revolutionary was that science fiction was still existing mostly at the margins. You either were a science fiction fan or you weren't. There weren't a ton of movies that were mass market successes. In fact, there might not have been any movies that were science fiction that you could call mass market successes. And suddenly this thing was on primetime television, which was prime real estate even and then this in some ways you could say this is one of the real beginnings of the nerd culture that's come to dominate 
Absolutely. And, and again, it, all the science fiction that had come to theater, silver screens before then, was usually of a Red Scare variety in, in those times. So, yeah, here you have a character like Chekhov who's embraced in it. And then you have a science fiction writers who were you know, doing those weird science magazines, et cetera, for a long time. Now Harlan Ellison, Theodore Sturgeon, all these people were able to write for television, which was pretty impressive. And, yeah, the show itself paved the way for the nerd culture, but also – our response to it when it was syndicated in the 70s, a period when Tolkien was getting big again and you know, uh, Star Trek and you know, obviously Doctor Who was a big part of fandom. But Star Trek was what created the whole convention culture. People were get, gathering and wondering if a new film was going to come out. So everything that we kind of take for granted now in, in the nerd culture really uh, was seeded from Star Trek. I mean, Star Trek really meant – Back in a time when, first of all, there weren't that many choices on television. There were like basically four or maybe five, if you were lucky, channels. Mm-hmm. You know that that somebody not planning to watch science fiction, someone not planning to watch something that took place in outer space with people wearing strange costumes and flying around in a uh, in some kind of odd ship, might wind up watching that. So, in terms of a gateway drug, it was a pretty huge thing. So, Caroline, uh, you know, we we have to go very fast here. We have to go at warp <laughs> speed to cover all this ground. Um, you know. Uh, if you get online or get into a barroom conversation, you'll find, just to go back to our original dichotomy, that there are Star Wars people and Star Trek people. But there are also Star Trek initial iteration people and Star Trek next generation yeah. people. I mean, this is really one of the big divides. That There are other things that came along since then, and, uh, and I know you have uh, admiration for Deep Space Nine, and we can talk about that as we go. But really, the, the, the big divide is between the Captain Kirk Star Trek and the Captain Picard one. Maybe you can say a little bit about that. Yeah, absolutely. So you get two really different ethos. I think that that original uh, show in the 1960s, it is a little bit more action adventure based. Uh, Kirk is is remembered as sort of the swashbuckling, handsome, charming captain. Uh, and then you get this reboot uh, in, the, in the next generation in the late 80s. And you have Captain Picard, who is this very philosophical, um, sort of removed, almost cold at times captain. And that sort of just lends to the show's ethos. Uh, I think it is a very different show than the original series. Of course, it's possible to like them both. I do. Many people do. Um, but my heart personally is going to lie with Next Gen in this debate. Uh, that's the show I was raised on pretty much since I was born. My parents were huge fans. So since I was a baby, sort of Captain Picard has been my second father figure. So that, that's where my heart lies. We'll see him also. The- Although the the first show, the Captain Kirk show, it had a lot of things in it, and some of the most prominent science fiction writers of that generation mm-hmm. wound up writing scripts for it and stuff like that. I think Harlan Ellison and people like that Absolutely. worked on it. Yep. But it was also kind of a western. Everybody yep. in it had been in westerns. I think you can get a can't you get a box set now of all the westerns that all, <laughs> that all of those. I mean, even Scotty, you know, James Dewan, they yep. they all were were actors out of westerns. And as Caroline is suggesting, it didn't entirely shake off that ethos. And I was a huge fan of Star Trek because I actually tripped across. Across it after running into the Wild Wild West. Mm-hmm. Captain James T. West was my kind of uh, beginning uh, foray into the world of, of that kind of hero. And then James T. Kirk really just fit the same mold. And uh, his uh, his sidekick was pretty much Spock and, and McCoy rolled into one. Uh, so the same thing. I love that, the, the rollicking space western feel of it all. And that really connected with me as a you know young kid. I was probably maybe 10 or 11 when I first ran across it. Uh, but, yeah, Star Wars was my first love. I have to come clean. And it was mostly through the uh, nudging of parent, parental units that were like, look, look, you can like this Star Wars thing, but you have to reference where it all comes from and, and check out this Star Trek thing. And uh, when I finally did, I, I fell in love with it. But, yeah, again, because of that that action adventure and that Western feel to it. All right. We're going to take a little break. When, we're going to, when we come back, we're going to talk about the philosophy of Star Trek. At some t- t- point, we'll explain to you newbies – what Sam means by the prime directive. All right, we're back. We're talking about Star Trek. The reason we're talking about Star Trek is it started 50 years ago. And uh, and we appear to be the only public radio show that noticed this. <laughs> so we're very excited about that, too. Uh, Sam Hatches with me in studio, co-host The Culture Dogs, Sunday nights on WWUH at 8 p.m. Uh, you'll be able to hear everything that's going on in movies and television and stuff like that. In fact, Sam, who I always count on to keep track of things that are going to happen that I don't know about, knows about the uh, the next iteration, iteration of Star Trek. And we'll certainly make sure we get to 
that before we're all done today. Uh, joining us from the studios of WBEZ in Chicago is Caroline Sida, a freelance writer who writes for the AV Club, Boing Boing Vox, and other places. And now joining us uh, by phone is Linda Wetzel. Uh, Linda Wetzel teaches a philosophy course uh, connected to Star Trek. She's an associate professor at Georgetown. Uh, this semester, she is teaching that course, Philosophy 180. Uh, I think it's too late for you to sign up. It's called Philosophy and Star Trek. Um, Linda Wetzel, welcome to our conversation. And first of all, how long have you been teaching this course for? Uh, since the year 2000, when I got tenure. <laughs> <laughs> and it, was it a tough sell anywhere within the department? Like, we're going to no. do the, you know, okay. No, they trust me. Yeah. And, and so explain why you thought Star Trek in particular is ripe for these kinds of considerations. Well, I actually grew up on Star Trek, and it's very conceptual. Mm -hmm. um, so, like, the original series tackled burning social issues of the day, such as racism and the Cold War, um, and, and, and it explores big ideas, many of them big philosophical ideas. It asks, what if? And then it runs with it. You know, what if there were a th thermonuclear war on Earth between the U.S. and the USSR? What if the Greek gods were aliens who visited us? You know, what if Lieutenant Riker got split in two by a transporter? These are called thought experiments. Since they can't actually be performed, philosophy is all about thought experiments. And not just philosophy, science, too. Supposedly, Einstein was on a train leaving the train station, and he asked himself, what would the clock look like if I were leaving the station at near the speed of light? Obviously, can't do that. It's a thought experiment. So Thought Track was full of thought experiments, many of them philosophical. If, for example, the question of what is it to have a mind mm -hmm. uh, gets multiple answers. They don't bother with consistency. That's, they don't feel obliged to do that. Different episodes, you get different answers to that question. Um, and so for a course... We can look at what their answers were and talk about the philosophy on exhibit. So I, I, want, I want us to be your class a little bit, uh, okay. Linda, and I, I want us to explore some of the questions that you like to explore. So, Caroline, I'm going to ask you, imagine that uh, tomorrow uh, transporter technology comes online. Now, once again, for you newbies, this is the thing where, you know, your body's in one place and something locks on to you in that one place. And suddenly, and you've heard this phrase, beam me up. Oh, uh, well, that means that your body appears in, in another place. But not just your body, you, the totality of you. Caroline, uh, would I be able to talk you into using this brand new technology, or would you kind of be a little bit worried about what would happen to you when you got beamed somewhere? You know, I don't think I'd be the first one to use it, but you can maybe talk me into being like the fifth one to use it, I would say. I mean, it would definitely be a risk. Uh, but, you know, I think that, that Star Trek has definitely made these things so appealing. I mean, I've certainly said this so many times in my life. Oh, I wish I could just transport here. Um, all these technological advances that, that sometimes do sort of bleed into the real world as well. And Sam, this is something that science fiction in general does, but it, it, which is ask philosophical questions, but dress them up in, in lycrex, lycra spandex uh, and, <laughs> and give them things to shoot. But the notion, I mean, I'm sure you have your own favorite examples of just, you know, ways in which science fiction is philosophy. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's yeah, all about the... The, the glitz and the glamour of, of the, the future trappings, but it's there's always some sort of thought underneath it all. Um, but before this, like I mentioned before, it was always a way to deal with the Red Scare, the Cold War, and how to process those fears. And then, you know, later on, Star Trek and other projects allowed you to think about more important things like racism, etc. But as long as there is a shiny red planet and some really cool steel, uh, you know, holes and uh, logos on your starships and a lot of model porn, that sort of thing, then uh, it helps kind of make the medicine go, go down, so to speak. So, Linda, one of the things, as you suggested, that's constantly being explored um, in Star Trek and, and, and in philosophy is what's the nature of the mind? You know, what's the nature of consciousness? Is consciousness the same as thinking? Uh, is a brain the, just sort of a, a biomechanical representation uh, of consciousness or does it exist someplace else? And so they're always doing stuff with that. And uh, we're going to use what we think is a charmingly bad clip. This is uh, in one, an episode from the original series, uh, Some Planet. It uh, needs a smart person to do their thinking for them, so they go and steal Spock's brain. Uh, and there are su there's the suggestion that his brain is doing the thinking, not some other thing separate from his physical body, uh, something like a soul. No, just the brain doing the work. Let's hear a little bit of that. What happened? I don't know. 
got him on complete life support. Was he dead? He was worse than dead. What do you mean? Jim. Come on, Bones, what's the mystery? His brain is gone. It's been removed surgically. How could he survive? It's the greatest technical job I've ever seen. Every nerve ending of the brain must have been neatly sealed. Nothing ripped, nothing torn, no bleeding. It's a medical miracle. If his brain is missing, then Spock is dying. No. An incredible Vulcan physique hung on to the life support cycle took over. His body lives, the autonomic functions continue. But there is no mind. Before we go to Linda, did you have something you wanted to say about that? Oh, no, I was just enjoying the uh, sound effects. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, so Linda, the, I mean, this is something that's been explored also in really crappy science fiction movies and monster and horror movies that preceded Star Trek, brains in jars and brains in tubs of saline solution and stuff like that. But th what they're really getting at is a much more pressing concern, and it's one that's a real bleeding edge of debate within philo philosophy still. It's, it's a little bit of the hard problem, right? Is the brain uh, just is, – is consciousness, does it exist – simply in a state of matter, a bunch of, you know, cells and, and fluids and electrical impulses, or is consciousness something else? So how did Star Trek handle all that? In, in multiply inconsistent ways. <laughs> there's, the, there's a Spock brain episode in which the suggestion is that his brain is doing the thinking, not some immaterial soul. Then there's Turnabout Intruder, where Kirk uh, changes places with Dr. Janet Lester, and you know, they have different bodies, different brains, and but they're somehow supposed to have their souls have switched. Now, that's called dualism. The Spock's brain episode is called physicalism, mm -hmm. and there's yet another completely different philosophy which says that really the only thing that matters is behavior. If the behavior is indicative of intelligence, we don't really care what the hardware is like. If the software is intelligent, the hardware, we don't care. And in that case, we don't even need a brain. We just need the right wiring. And hence, we have the case of data. Data does not have a human brain. Data has a neural network, very complicated, but somehow it enables him to think. All the behavior is there, so we say, okay, you need some kind of physicality, but not necessarily the kind that humans have. Uh, we have to talk a little bit about Data. He's probably my favorite character from uh, Star Trek The Next Generation. Uh, and, and Caroline, uh, since Star Trek The Next Generation is your favorite iteration of the series, what's Data or who is Data to you? Yeah, so Data is the android crew member of uh, the Enterprise. And so he sort of fits what I refer to as sort of the outsider character. That's it's sort of what Spock was created. You know, he was the only alien on board this ship of humans. And each Star Trek iteration sort of progressively asks bigger questions about these outsider characters. So Data really fits that role. He's not an alien. He's literally not human. Uh, he's not alive in the traditional sense. And so what I find really interesting is that because there have been so many different versions of Star Trek, you get the show able to ask these philosophical questions over and over and over. So you have Spock's brain, which, by the way, is generally considered one of the worst original <laughs> series episodes. So listeners out there, don't start with that one. Right, no. um, but, you know, it certainly does raise some philosophical questions. And then those can be responded to in an episode like Measure of a Man, in which uh, Data is literally put on trial to determine if he is a... Uh, a sentient being that d deserves the rights um, that a human would. So it's very cool to see the show sort of ask and answer these questions multiple times across 50 years of history. You know, although, Sam, I feel as though, I mean, I loved Data, yeah. but as I think about him now and I think about the kinds of questions that Linda would be considering in her class, I mean, Data skips so many steps, right? Sure. I mean, he, sk he skips over the singularity. He skips over, you know, all the questions about what would happen if a machine achieved some level of crude consciousness. At what point would we recognize volition uh, in that machine? All, all this kind of stuff. I mean, he's kind of a guy, you know? <laughs> Indeed. And they quickly have him uh, have relations with uh, Lieutenant Tasha Yar very quickly in the show. So, yeah, he, he's, he's one of the guys. Um, but the, the thing that I do enjoy about Data, 
possibly over Spock is that Spock is he's very cool with himself. He's like, I know I'm, I'm a Vulcan. I'm 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 the man. Whereas Data is very inquisitive about humanity and is is a very Pinocchio esque character. He's looking to gain humanity or understand it, and and that's cool. And then that gives the writers lots of fodder for him to you know kind of come at all sorts of human constructs and, and thought processes from a bewildered you know viewpoint. All right, so uh, uh, I think Caroline mentioned measure of a man. Uh, here's a clip. This is the, the one she was talking about where Data's um, humanity, I guess you might say, is on trial. Data is a Starfleet officer. He still has certain rights. Rights, rights. I'm sick to death of hearing about rights. What about my right not to have my life work subverted by blind ignorance? We have rule of law in this Federation. You cannot simply seize people and experiment with them to prove your pet theories. Thank you. Now you're doing it. Data is an extraordinary piece of engineering, but it is a machine. If you permit it to resign, it will destroy years of work in robotics. Starfleet does not have to allow the resignation. Commander, who do you think you're working for? Starfleet is not an organization that ignores its own regulations when they become inconvenient. Whether you like it or not, Data does have rights. Let me put it another way. Would you permit the computer of the Enterprise to refuse a refit? That's an interesting point. But the Enterprise computer is property. Is data? Of course. <sighs> there may be law to support this position. Then find it. A ruling with such broad-ranging implications must be supported. So, Linda Wetzel, this is uh, halfway about the Dred Scott decision and halfway about kind of the, the kinds of decisions that we might have to make into the future, whether certain machines are more are, are entitled to more consideration, have more interests, have more standing than, say, my refrigerator does right now. Yes. I mean, and I think that uh, the time is getting closer and closer. As Marvin Minsky said, if we're lucky, they'll keep us as pets. <laughs> so you're, you're a couple of weeks into the semester uh, r right now. Um, what are you teaching about? What are your students talking about? And how are they reacting to all this material? We're doing time. So we talk about the two theories of time. And once we get them on the table, we can talk about time travel, which is a mind blower. Um, and so that's what we're working on right now. Um, there, are some, there are many time travel episodes in Star Trek. Some are perfectly coherent and make sense. Others not so much, even if they're fun episodes. And so we can look at them and figure out which is a coherent story of time. Um, we're going to take a little break right now. When we come back, we're also going to talk. Uh, there's sort of a political science uh, part of this equation. We're going to talk about that as well. Uh, and uh, Caroline and Sam are going to bring us up to date on other aspects of Star Trek, including the fact that there's a whole another iteration coming. build a wall in space and make the Romulans pay for it. Today's show is produced by Commander Jonathan McPants and me, Kyone Wolf. Greg Hill and Alan Yu appeared in the intro. We had some interns in red shirts, but they were all killed on an away team mission. The part of Bill Curry was played by Ricardo Montalban. Thanks also to Rebecca Castellani. Find us on Twitter at WNPR Colin and on Facebook at the Colin McEnroe Show page. And now... Back to Colin. All right. We're going to talk a little bit more about uh, the politics of Star Trek and the political science of Star Trek. Uh, still with us, uh, Sam Hatch, the co-host of The Culture Dogs on Sunday nights on WWUH. Listen to them this Sunday night at 8 p.m. and every Sunday night at 8 p.m. Caroline Sida, a freelance writer who writes for the AV Club, Boing Boing, Vox, and other places. She's been writing about Star Trek. But now, we, now that we know what a great guest she is, we want to know what else she's writing about so we can do future shows with her. Uh, Timothy Sandifer is the author of The Permission System. Society, how the ruling class turns our freedoms into privileges and what we can do about it, which comes out next week. Uh, pertinently for our show, he wrote an essay on the politics of Star Trek for last summer's issue of the Claremont Review of Books. Welcome to this conversation, Timothy Sandifer. Thank, thanks for asking me. So I want um, I want to begin in, in, in where I sort of think uh, what I think is the beginning, which is, you know, 50 years ago, Star Trek arrives on the scene. We are in the middle of the Cold War and we're, we're about to get you know, knee deep into Vietnam. And I feel as though if you're going to look at the politics of 
uh, of Star Trek. You kind of have to begin there that it's really a, a show initially about what does it mean to be a superpower and, and to what degree are we I mean, in some ways, the prime directive, which for people who don't watch Star Trek, you know, sort of says don't interfere in other cultures is is the antithesis of the domino theory, right? Which is do interfere with uh, with other cultures because otherwise it's going to wash up on our feet. Yeah, I think uh, I think the Vietnam experience is is a huge turning point in the history of Star Trek as a as a series as a franchise because it was it was the brainchild of people like Gene Roddenberry who were post World War II liberals. They had come out of World War II with the idea of technological progress, a mission of civilization, anti-totalitarianism, universal human rights. And in, in, the, in that effort, then they ran into the Vietnam conflict. And although Star Trek is still kind of early relative to Vietnam, it's mentioned several times in the show. And by the time Next Generation comes along in the, 90, in the late 80s and early 90s, the, the Vietnam experience has transformed the political philosophy of Star Trek in a dramatic way. Now, one of the questions that comes up again and again in Star Trek, and with our previous guests, we ran out of time, but we were going to talk, in fact, about about an episode called The Perfect Mate, uh, which was about a woman who was being uh, handed from from kind of owner to owner uh, in what appeared to be a violation of her own free will, although she sort of asserted that she didn't really see things that way. She was from a different culture. She hadn't grown up with um, with free will. Uh, she, she basically said it would be asking me to think about this the way that you think about this would be like asking a Vulcan to give up logic. I think about things differently from the way that you do. And this in international relations is also a fundamental question, right? To what degree do we take our ideas about Western democracy and impose them on someone else? Yeah, and Captain Kirk, the original series, Captain Kirk, it represents this idea rooted ultimately in the Enlightenment of the 18th century. I mean, J Captain Cook is based on an actual captain, Captain James Cook, the great 18th century explorer who discovered Hawaii and mapped the, the coast of Australia and so forth, the greatest of all explorers on Earth. And the they share the same civilizing mission of spreading the ideas of science, technology, and progress and freedom throughout the galaxy. And so Kirk is not afraid to, to liberate oppressed alien races when he encounters them. The most famous example of that is in the episode The Apple, which I think is the quintessential episode of the original Star Trek, when Kirk discovers a planet that's being ruled over by this totalitarian computer and destroys it in order to liberate the people. By the time Next Generation comes around, Cultural and moral relativism have taken such hold that you have exactly the opposite viewpoint being expressed. There's no way that Captain Picard would do such a thing. In fact, I personally, I find it repulsive that the next generation repeatedly refuses to exercise judgment and to <laughs> liberate people, uh, aliens who are discovered who are, who are suffering from slavery and oppression. Picard is perfectly content to leave them in their chains because he thinks that represents a higher form of knowledge. So I want to talk about this some more, but let's just back up to the Apple, the one that you mentioned. So this is, um, uh, as you say, it's uh, Val is sort of a computer tyrant ruling over an idyllic planet. Uh, he's an omniscient totalitarian. He demands sacrifices. The natives think of themselves only as the people of Val. They don't really have any culture, freedom, science. They don't know how to do much of anything <laughs> except whatever it is that Val wants them to do. So uh, here's a little bit uh, from that episode. I think uh, this is, uh, you'll hear a little bit of, of Captain Kirk after you hear from the people of Val. But it was Val who put the fruit on the trees, caused the rain to fall. Val cared for us. You'll learn to care for yourselves with our help. And there's no trick to putting fruit on trees. You might even enjoy it. You learn to build for yourselves, think for yourselves, work for yourselves, and what you create is yours. That's what we call freedom. You'll like it a lot. And you'll learn something about men and women, the way they're supposed to be, caring for each other, being happy with each other, being good to each other. That's what we call love. You'll like that, too, a lot, you and your children. What are children? The little ones look like you. They just go on the way you're going. You'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's what you, uh, Tim, want. Uh, you, you, what that's what you want a Starfleet commander to do, right? To sort of look at the situation and say, you know what, this is really effed up. You know, uh, I'm going to fix it. I don't care what the rule is. 
That's right. I think what Kirk has basically done in that scene is to articulate the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So I, I'm wondering, since Caroline and I are both big fans of The Next Generation, and I, I don't have the bandwidth to do this right now, can you make a case, Caroline, for Picard's way of handling stuff like this? Well, you know, I think Star Trek presents the prime directive, this this um, idea of non-interference. It does really present it as this is Starfleet's, you know, number one most important rule, and this is what you must follow all the time. But I think the way it works out in practice is is more like, let's start from a place of, of non-interference and sort of like non-imperialism, and then let's evaluate from there uh, so that it doesn't necessarily always become Picard follows it every single time. A lot of episodes center on him actually breaking it. So I think maybe that would be the defense that I would have, that it's more of, you know, to go back to thought experiments that we were talking about, let's take that as the initial thought, that non-interference thought. Let's evaluate the situation. Let's see uh, what's going on here and then maybe make a decision from there. And, and Tim, I guess the other thing I would ask is why isn't why doesn't does Kirk in these situations not equal Trump? In other words, one of our concerns about Donald Trump as a possible president is he would substitute his own judgment for protocol, for international law, for for mores that have existed in other cultures. That that he would just trample over everything that existed because he, at some internal level, thinks that he always knows what's right. So why would why wouldn't Kirk alarm you the way say Donald Trump might alarm well, you? Well, I think Kirk is, you know, we, we tend to underestimate nowadays how intelligent and principled a man Captain Kirk is. He's, he's an extremely well-educated man, a, high, a highly intelligent scientist, uh, in addition to being a great explorer and discoverer. In the more recent, like the J.J. Abrams movies, the Kirk in those movies, you're absolutely right, is Donald Trump. It's, he's based, his actions are based purely on what he feels at that particular moment, and he doesn't really care about anything. But the, the Kirk in the original series is a, is a man deeply committed to the idea of universal human rights, justice, and principles. And it's funny, that this issue of the Prime Directive, the reason the Prime Directive was introduced in the original Star Trek was sort of as a foil, as a representative of moral obtuse and I think it was funny, just the other day, an actor, um, Robert Beltran, who played uh, Chakotay in Star Trek Voyager, he was quoted in a story saying uh, that he considered the Prime Directive to be, quote, fascist crap. He said the idea of leaving any species to die in its own filth when you have the ability to help them just because you want to let them go through their normal evolutionary process is bunk. He gets it. That's exactly right. That was the perspective of the original Star Trek. Unfortunately, the Prime Directive was gradually elevated into this dogma of non-interference that basically says, to quote Abraham Lincoln, if one man wishes to enslave another, no third man should be allowed to object. That's the idea of the next generation. Yeah, I mean, Sam, you said at the beginning of the show, they break the prime directive all the time. Is that because the prime directive is fascist crap? It might be, yeah. <laughs> we'll find out. But yeah, and that, that was kind of the, as was mentioned before, that was the, the, the hope was that the captain would have uh, an ethical compass that could take that into consideration and then break the rules as need be when things were just completely ridiculous when you know you can't just watch this entire civilization burn when you have all this technology that can easily save them so that's eventually what and it creates drama in itself too because there's always going to be some sort of court martial or some sort of you know problem with the admiral uh, looking down at you sternly for saving somebody um, uh, very quickly, because we're about to run out of time, but Tim, I know that you, both you and Sam uh, see uh, Star Trek VI, the movie Star, Star Trek VI, Undiscovered Country, uh, which appeared only months after Gene Roddenberry's death, uh, as some kind of turning point. Can you, uh, in a nutshell, Tim, tell us what kind of turning point that was? Well, I, it was the first movie to really to specifically address a political subject, and it tried to talk about the end of the Cold War. The problem is that the the perspective it took on the end of the Cold War it, it is it was basically to whitewash the history of the Klingon Empire. The Klingons are an aggressive race that has oppressed, enslaved, and murdered countless uh, uh, free peoples of the galaxy. And Star Trek VI tells us that the way to peace is to forget all of that. In fact, to blame ourselves for the, the evils that the Klingons have committed. And that's, that really was, represents, the, I think, the, the beginning of the betrayal of what Star Trek really stood for, which, again, was universal human rights and the principles of the Declaration of Independence. Sam Hatch, you like this movie? You will have 45 seconds to explain why. Oh, I, I like it more because of its uh, references to Hamlet and <laughs> those aspects as opposed to its uh, political leanings. Um, 
that said, it's also a good whodunit. There's also a, a murder mystery at the heart of that film. So from all sorts of cinematic tropes, I think it falls together nicely. Um, we're just about out of time here. Sam, I want to give you just a, a minute or so. Uh, you know a little bit about what is to come here. There is another iteration of Star Trek uh, in the pipeline. What is it? Yeah, it's been. Uh, it's called the Star Trek Discovery. And, and on television, the series has stalled for a long time after Enterprise. Uh, and this is going to bridge the gap between Star Trek Enterprise and the original classic series taking place maybe 10 years before the classic series. And the thing I am the most excited about it is because it's going to embrace a little bit more of a modern archetype storytelling that a lot of uh, television shows are delving into now where you can have an entire situ- entire season devoted to a situation and have it kind of grow slowly instead of more episodic structures. I'm wondering, too, if Battlestar Galactica put a little pressure on to develop that kind of storyline. I'm sure, too. yeah. Um, uh, anybody that we've ever heard of going to be in this? I haven't heard anything except for one character named Number One, who's uh, a woman and is a lieutenant on the ship, and, and that's all I've heard so far. No casting or anything of that like. So, But it should be on um, in 2017, it's going to be on CBS's new streaming service, CBS All Access. Well, uh, so they're going to want you to pay $5 a month just to watch Star Trek, basically. Well, streaming is number one when you think about it. <laughs> it's so, true. Um, <laughs> Caroline, I, I just want to give you a, a minute or so as we begin to wrap up here. One thing that we didn't talk about is Deep Space Nine, and you are a big fan of that. It's, you say it's not as iconic and bristling with these kind of legendary figures as the first two uh, series were, but what is it that you like about it? Well, I always say if you want to see the most iconic parts of Star Trek, you've got to watch the original series or Next Generation. If you want to watch the best parts of Star Trek, I would always recommend Deep Space Nine. This show is set on a space station rather than a traveling spaceship. So, I mean, talking politically, it really is grappling with sort of ongoing political concerns, um, philosophical concerns. It is considered the darker uh, Star Trek series. And so you do have a little bit more interpersonal conflict. You do have things that aren't so easily resolved. Um, you have a lot more racial diversity than you have in the other series. And you really do have Trek for the first time experimenting with that sort of serialized storytelling. So the other good thing is that there aren't there aren't any terrible seasons of Deep Space Nine. Like I would say you should definitely skip the first two seasons of Next Generation. Deep Space Nine, you can start from the beginning, go all the way through, and you will be entertained throughout. Well, maybe I'll go back. Maybe I'll go back and try it. All right. Sam Hatch, thanks for joining us in studio. 8 p.m. Sunday night, WWUH's Culture Dogs. Caroline Cedo, we want to do another show with you. You're great. Uh, and uh, T- Timothy Sandifer, thanks so much, uh, who wrote an essay on the politics of Star Trek for last summer's issue of the Claremont Review of Books. Thank you, Jonathan McNichol, for producing today's show. Scotty, reverse thrust. No, I'm sorry, but we in HR have decided that Scotty will be taking over our Twitter feed from now on. But he's our chief engineer. We need him to... Tweet and be the chief of security for no extra compensation? You betcha. Beam her out, Scotty. Scotty.